In the last video I gave some homework, which was to create a double jump for the player. The way I approach anything that I have never coded before is to first define what it is. A double jump is an extra jump that can be used when the player is not grounded. That means that a double jump cannot happen when the player is running around on the ground. The double jump can only happen one time, so making a boolean that stores if we are able to double jump seems like a good idea. The double jump can be performed once every time the player jumps. To accomplish this we should refresh it when the player lands. Let's start by creating a new variable. I will name it has double jump and set it to be equal to true. Next I will move the and self grounded to its own if statement, because we want to be able to double jump on the same keys as we perform the normal jump with. Next we can go ahead and remove the self.grounded equals false. We don't need it anymore since we implemented the end contact code in the last episode. Now we can go ahead and create an else if statement that will check the has double jump variable. If it's true, then we will set it to be equal to false and set the y velocity to be equal to the jump amount. I want the double jump to be less powerful than the normal jump, so I will multiply it by 0.8. Now we need to set has double jump back to true in the land function. If we run the game, you can see that we are able to double jump. To make our jumping feel better, we are going to add a grace timer that will allow the player to jump if it was grounded recently. If you prevent the player from jumping the very next frame, when it is no longer on the ground, it just feels bad. To do this we need two variables. One that keeps track of the grace time that remains, and one that stores the total duration. I will name them grace time, which will be 0 by default, and grace duration that I will set to be 0.1 seconds. Inside the jump function, we will add an or statement that will check if the grace time is greater than 0. This will allow the player to jump even if it is not on the ground, so long as it has grace time. We also need to remember to set the grace time to zero if the player has jumped. Next we need to create a function that decreases the grace time when the player is not on the ground. I will name it decrease grace time. Remember calling it in the update function. Inside we will check if the player is not grounded and reduce the grace time by delta time if that is the case. Finally, we need to reset the grace time when the player lands. We can do this by setting the grace time to be equal to grace duration inside of the land function. This is a bit difficult to show off, so you will just have to take my word for it, but it feels a lot better now. You should experiment with different values on the grace duration and see what you find works best in your opinion. Let's make the player look a bit more interesting by adding some animations to it. First of all, I'm going to create a new function named load assets in the player file. This is just to break things up a bit so we don't end up with a massive load function. Remember to also call it in the player load function. Next, we create a table named animation and create two new variables inside of it. Timer that I will set to be equal to 0 and rate that I will set to be equal to 0 0.1. Our player will have three different types of animations, which will all animate at 10 frames per second. If you want to have different speeds for different animations, you will need to create these two variables for each of the animations. I will start by creating the run animation. Make a new table inside of the animation table and name it run. Inside of the run table, we are going to create two new variables. Total, which we will set to be equal to 6 the total number of frames in this animation. The second variable will be named current, which we will set to be equal to 1. It's going to keep track of which frame we are currently on. Now we can go ahead and load in the animation. To do this effectively, we will use a loop. A loop is a way to tell our program to do something specific multiple times, in this case loading images. We will use a simple for loop. To create it, we type the for keyword. Then we need to declare a variable and set it to be equal to a number value. In this example, i equals 1. Next we need to add a comma and type another number. This will be the target for the loop. In our case, we can use the self.animation.run.total variable. 
Similarly to adding a then at the end of an if statement, we will add do at the end of a for loop. Let's check what happens inside of this loop and what the local variable i is equal to. We can do this by simply printing the value i with the print function. As you can see, i gets incremented by 1 for each loop. We could rename this variable to anything, for example, number. The important thing is that we declare a variable with a starting value for the loop. If we, for example, set the value to be equal to minus 2 and run the program, you can see that we go from minus 2 all the way to 6. So the second number is the target value, not the amount of times it will loop. There is a third argument that we can set, which is the amount that i will increment each loop. If I set it to be equal to 2 and rerun the program, you can see that it now increments by 2 each loop. I will set the i variable back to be equal to 1. One way to insert data into a table is by using brackets and a number. For example, let's create a table named people. We can fill it with a bunch of names by typing people brackets 1 equals Bob and people brackets 2 equals Fred. This stores the values at the specified index instead of a named variable. Let's use that to store our images into a table named image that we will store inside of the run table. Outside of the loop, we would need to store the frames individually by setting run.image brackets 1 to be equal to love.graphics.newImage and passing in the path to the first image. For each new frame, we would need to increment the index that we store the image at as well as the number in the file name. A better way would be to do this inside of the loop and have it be automated. Since we know that i will count up to the total number of frames, we can use it to load the animations. It will be very similar to the manual way, except that we replace the hardcoded value with the variable i inside of the brackets. To do the same thing for the file path, we need to first break it up into two separate strings. Assets slash player slash run slash and dot png. Between these two strings, we will concatenate the i variable by adding two dots on each side of it. This combines them into one string. I will repeat this process for the two other animations that I intend to use, idle and air. The only difference here is that those only have four frames, so we need to make sure that we set the total variable to be equal to four. Next we will create a new variable named self.animation.draw. This will store the current frame that we want to draw. Initially, we will set it to be equal to the first image of the idle animation. We want to do this so that we can get the dimensions of the asset. To store the dimensions, we will create two new variables, self.animation.width and height. We will set these variables to be equal to the self.animation.draw variable and call the love functions get width and height on them. This returns the width and height of the image. Now we can go ahead and draw the player. Even though it doesn't animate yet, it is still a good idea to check that we are on the right track. Down in the player draw function, we will use the love.graphics.draw function. The first argument it takes is the image that we want to draw. We want to use the animation.draw variable. Next we need to pass in the coordinates, self.x and self.y. If we run the game now, you can see that the player is being drawn, but there are two problems. First of all, it's quite heavily offset, and second, it's very blurry. The reason the sprite is offset has to do with the fact that the image is being drawn from the top left corner. While our player's x and y coordinates are at the center of the physics object. We can fix this by offsetting the image by half of its width and height. While we could do this by modifying the x and y coordinates that we draw it on, we might as well do it properly and change the origin point. To be able to offset the origin point, which is done with the 7th and 8th arguments, we need to first set the arguments that come before them. The first of these arguments is the rotation which we will set to 0, meaning no rotation. Next we need to set the x and y scale of the image to 1, 
meaning no change of scaling. Now we can reach the origin point offset and set them to be equal to half of the image width and height respectively. If we rerun the game now, you can see that it looks a lot better. Next we need to fix the blur. This is caused by anti-aliasing, which kicks in by default when we scale images. This is normally fine, except when you're working with pixel art. To disable it, we can call love.graphics.setDefault filter and pass in nearest and nearest. This only applies to images that are loaded after the fact, so we should call it at the top of our main.lua file. Now when we run the game, you can see that our player is looking sharp. It's time to make the animation, well, animate. To do that, we are going to create a new function named animate. Remember calling it in the update function. This will handle how often the animations will swap images, and we will use the timer and rate variables to set this. First of all, we will increment the timer by dt. Then we will check if the timer is greater than the rate. If this is the case, then we need to set the timer back to zero so that it starts over. Now we can create a new function and name it setNewFrame. This function will take care of actually updating the image that we want to draw. We want this to occur when the animation timer resets, so we will call it inside of the if statement. In order to have this function being able to handle all of our different animations, we will create a local variable named anim and set it to be equal to self.animation.run. The local anim table is now a reference to the self.animation.run. This is really important to understand. We did not make a new table and copy over the values. If we do any changes to the anim table, those changes are mirrored in the original animation.run table. When this function is called, we want to increment the current frame that the animation is at, but only if the current frame is not the last frame. If it is the last frame, then we want to set it back to 1. To accomplish this, we can make an if statement that checks if the anim.current is smaller than anim.total. If that is the case, we can increment the current frame by 1. Next we make an else statement that handles when that is not the case, and set the current frame back to 1. All that remains now is to set the image that the player should draw to be equal to the current image of the animation. We do that by setting the self.animation.draw to be equal to the anim.image in brackets anim.current. If we run the game now, you can see that the player is animated. However, when we walk towards the left, it does a cool, but non-intended moonwalk. To fix that, we will create a new variable for the player named direction, and set it to be equal to right. Then we should create a new function named setDirection, that will handle changing the direction variable. As usual, make sure that you call it in the update function. Now we can check if the player's x velocity is smaller than zero, meaning we are moving towards the left, and set the direction variable to be equal to left. To set the direction back to the right, we can create an else if statement that checks if the x velocity is greater than zero. If that is the case, we set the direction to be equal to right. This sets it up so that the player's direction does not change if you stop moving. Next, we can make a local variable in the draw function and name it scale x. I will set it to be equal to 1 by default and replace the fifth argument in the player draw function, which is the x scale, with the local variable that we just created. Now we can do a simple if statement that checks if the player's direction is left and set the x scale variable to be equal to minus 1. A negative scale will flip the image. And as you can see, the player is now always turned towards the direction that it's moving in. We have two more animations to add to the player, but in order for us to be able to draw the correct animation at the correct time, we need to have a system in place that determines the state of the player. Let's start by creating a new variable named state and set it to be equal to idle by default. Next we will make a function and name it setState. Remember calling it in the update function. If the player is in the air, we want the player's state to also be air. But what can we use to determine if the player is in the air or not? Well, our grounded variable already keeps track of this, so all we need to do is type 
if not self grounded, then, and set the state to be equal to air. Next, we need to determine if the player is idle or moving. We can do that by checking if the x velocity is equal to zero, and set the state to be equal to idle if that is the case. Finally, we can make an else statement, because if the player is not idle and not in the air, well, then the player must be moving. Here we set the state to be equal to run. To check if this is working, we should go ahead and print self.state. If we run the game, you can see that the state that is being printed is correct. It's always a good idea to validate that your code does what you intend it to do, as early as possible. You will save yourself a ton of debugging later down the line. Remember that we could use brackets on a table to reach a value at a specific index. We can use brackets to reach a key, or in other words, named variables, in a similar way. In the setNewFrame function, we can reach the run table by typing brackets and the string run inside of it. Now if only we had a way to get a string of the current state that the player is in. Well, we actually do. That's why we made the self.state variable. Simply insert it into the brackets, run the game, and enjoy the fact that all three animations are working. It's almost like magic. While we are in the game, I want to demonstrate an issue that we have not yet resolved. If you stand below a platform and jump, the player seems to get stuck for a brief moment. This is due to the fact that the y velocity is unaffected by the fact that we collide with the platform, because it's above us. Our begin contact code is only checking and resolving collisions with objects that are below the player. Fixing this is very simple. Inside of the if statement that handles when the player is the a fixture, we create an else if statement that checks if ny is smaller than zero. If this is the case, we set the player's y velocity to be equal to zero. We need to do the same thing, but flipped for the times when the player is the b fixture. Check if ny is greater than zero and set the y velocity to be equal to zero. If we rerun the game now, you can see that the player no longer gets stuck. One of the coolest things with programming is that you can approach and solve an issue in multiple different ways. I want to show you an alternative way of doing the code for the acceleration and friction, which uses a lot fewer lines of code. I have two reasons for doing it this way. First of all, I believe it is easier to understand the concept of the original method that we used. Finally, I believe that it is easier to understand this new way that I intend to show you if you did it the other way first. Let's look at the first if statement inside of the player move function. Basically, it compares two values, the maximum allowed speed and the x velocity that we would have if we added acceleration to it. And then it picks the lowest of the two. In the Lua math library, there is a function that compares two values and returns the lowest one. It's called math.min. This means that we can set the x velocity to be equal to math.min and pass in x velocity plus acceleration multiplied by dt as the first value and the maximum speed as the second. When it comes to moving towards the left, it compares the same values, except that it picks the greater value. For this, we can use the math.max function. This function works the same way as math.min, except that it returns the larger number. Similarly to the other example, we set the x velocity to be equal to math.max, and pass in the x velocity after we have applied acceleration to it, and the negative maximum speed. Now the move function is a lot cleaner with fewer lines of code, while still having the same functionality. We can shorten our friction code in the same way. That will be your homework, so go ahead and try to do that until the next episode. I will show you how it's done then, so don't worry if you struggle or run into any kind of issues. Thank you for watching. If this video was helpful, leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. I read all the comments. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. The full source code of this episode is available in a link below.